beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 8, Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night. Behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. And it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a, and a man's heart was given to it. Suddenly another beast, the second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. John Walvoord was a, a great Bible expositor, great Bible teacher, especially uh, knowledgeable as it related to prophecy and, and uh, the book of Revelation and Daniel especially. John Walvoord said the seventh chapter of Daniel provides the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of future events to be found anywhere in the Old Testament. As we begin chapter 7, chapter 7 begins the prophetic section of what is uh, the book of Daniel. Chronologically, these events occur be between the events, just to give you background, between the events that are recorded actually in chapters 4 and 5. Uh, chapter 4 closed with the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 5 began with the fall of Babylon. And so that would make the date of, uh, of this particular chapter, the vision and all the dream, that would make the date 553 B.C., which would be 14 years before the fall of Babylon. And so what we have here in this chapter is a prophetic picture, and we just looked at it. We'll be seeing that in some detail in a moment. But we have a prophetic picture of four great world empires. The empires are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And it ends with a picture of the return of Christ and the establishing of his kingdom, and that's pictured by a fifth and final kingdom, one, he says, that does not pass away. We'll see that in verse 14. So this prophetic picture specifically relates to events in what are called the latter days. Now, this was first revealed in chapter 2. In, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 28, it said, there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And so this is actually something that relates to what we've, we've already seen in previous chapters. Now, when we were looking at the first six chapters, remember that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, had had two dreams that were interpreted by Daniel's. But in this chapter, it is Daniel who receives a communication in a dream. Now, the Bible records that God spoke in times past in various ways. And as I was thinking about this and introducing this, when you look at the fact that he's receiving a dream and that God is going to give to him prophetic insight, and when you consider the fact that he already had dealt with, Daniel had already dealt with dreams on, on two different occasions in, uh, in the first six chapters and all, I, I thought I'd, I'd remind you of a few things that God in, in, uh, in times past, has spoken to and communicated in a variety of ways. And, and so think of this for a moment, like he might speak directly 
he did so to Job. You see, when we went through the book of Job, that he actually said to him, gird yourself as a man and answer some questions. God spoke to Job. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to Samuel. He spoke to Elijah. There were times when he actually audibly would communicate. We know that. There were times that he spoke through angels. He did that when he was ministering to Joshua. An angel spoke to Joshua. He even used a donkey. He used a donkey to speak a warning to a false prophet by the name of Balaam. He uses dreams. He did so when he ministered to Jacob. And Jacob had a dream about a ladder that attached to earth to heaven, Jacob's ladder. He saw that in, in Genesis chapter 28. And later on in the Gospel of John in chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus told us that he was that ladder that Jacob was speaking about and dreamt of. He also obviously has directed people through his word. He directed people through what is called the, the book of the law, which is his word. So there are various ways that God speaks, and God speaks through prophets. The book of Hebrews tell us, tells us that in, in chapter 1, verse 1, where it simply says, in, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And so this is what is happening here in chapter 7. God is speaking to Daniel. Daniel is a prophet, and he's speaking to him in a dream. And the dream is prophetic. In Numbers 12, verse 6, God said, If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. And so Daniel has had a dream. And verse 1 tells us that the Lord is speaking to him, and Daniel is writing down. He says in verse 1, the last portion in verse 1 of chapter 7, it says he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. And so he writes down the essentials. Now in verse 2, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night, behold, four winds of heaven. So these are the main facts. These are the main facts that he wrote down. He speaks of the four winds of heaven. There are different ways to look at this. The four winds of heaven could speak of the four corners of the earth. We saw that in Revelation 7.1. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. So there are commentators who say, well, the four winds of heaven could speak of the four corners of the world. It can also speak, though, of the whole of humanity. You see, stirring up the great sea could speak of a commotion that's among the nations in the world. And again, I'm going to be cross-referencing a number of times, by the way, in my introduction with Revelation. So speaking of this great sea, we saw that in Revelation 17, verse 1, where it says, One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. And then in chapter 17, verse 15, he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so this could be speaking of the four corners of the earth, speaking of the whole of humanity. And so he says, I saw in my vision, verse 2 by night, behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Humanity is being stirred up. Verse 3, four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So the stirring up produces these four great Gentile powers. Now, he speaks of four great Gentile powers, and that corresponds numerically to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. N Nebuchadnezzar had this dream of this, uh, this great image, remember, and it had four metals. But Daniel sees four animals. Now, this contrasts man's value of kingdoms with what God knows them to be. Man very often values the kingdom of man. And that's why you saw that Nebuchadnezzar was the, the head of gold because the great power, great authority and all that he had was valued by man. And so when you saw the image and the four different me, uh, metals that descended in value, that was man's view of what man's empires are like. But this particular dream that Daniel has is showing us how God sees man's kingdoms. God sees the brutality, the inhumanity, and the depravity of the kingdoms of man. And that's what you see. And so he begins to describe this in verse 4. The first, he said, was like a lion. It had eagle's wings. 
And so he speaks concerning this, and he says, he watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And so the first is like a lion. The lion is Babylon. When you look at old um, pictures of the, the construction in all of ancient Babylon, winged lions guarded the royal palaces. Both lions and eagles are in, in scripture, scripture as well as in, in just in general. Uh, the lions and eagles are symbolic of royalty. Lions are to this day still referred to as the king of beasts. And the eagles are still referred to as the king of the birds. And so like a lion, Babylon was powerful, swift to conquer. But notice the wings that were plucked off it speaks of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling and his conversion. Remember how that he had gone through seven times, some saying that that's seven years where he had lost his mind and, and his hair had grown and his, and his uh, like, like birds' feathers and his, his, uh, his fingernails and toenails had grown like talons and, and all. And remember, he had lost his mind until he recognized that God is the God of the, of the earth and all of that. And so the wings that were plucked off would speak of Nebuchadnezzar's humbling and his conversion in chapter 4. It says here that a man's heart was given to him, and that, that speaks of where he came to see that he was only a man. And so we see this. And then in verse 5, suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much. Devour much flesh. Okay, suddenly there's this other beast. It's like a bear. That would be Medo-Persia, the second kingdom. They used great amounts of troops to conquer. When you look into history, they would amass great troops and they would overwhelm their opponents. And so the picture of their military is like the lumbering of a bear. They were known to be ferocious when they attacked but they were not looked at as being majestic the way the Babylonians were. Isaiah speaks of them, the Medes, in Isaiah 13, 18, and this is what he says. He says, their, their bows will strike down the young men. They will have no mercy on infants, nor will they look with compassion on children. Isn't that interesting? Because we're seeing something like that even right now. It just shows the inhumanity and depravity of these uh, military individuals. Here it says that it was raised up on one side. Now, all of this, by the way, I should say this, I'm just giving to you kind of like a, uh, a panoramic view because as we go through the next several chapters, there's going to be more detail. So what I'm doing is just kind of moving through this quickly to give you a, a foundation. And then we're going to be picking this up and looking at it in more detail as we go through. And so just just bear with me about that. But Notice it was raised up on one side. Now, being raised up on one side uh, would be a picture of the unequal relationship between the Medes and the Persians. In what is called the Medo-Persian Empire, there were actually two different people groups, the Medes as well as the Persians. The Persians overwhelmed the Medes, and so the Persians were the greater of the two groups. And so in being raised on one side, it would show that there was actually a superiority of one group over the other. It speaks of three ribs in its mouth. That could, that could be a picture of the people who had been subdued by the Medo-Persians, but others say that this may very well be simply a picture of Media and Persia and Babylon, the three major components of what is called the Medo-Persian Empire. And so it's just a picture in that way. He's going to give us more in a moment. In verse 6, he says, after this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Four heads. We all have four heads. No, but <laughs> it, had it was like a leopard. It had four wings. This is Greece. Now, a leopard is swift. And so the, the wings are emphasizing the swiftness of the Greek military. So under Alexander, the Greeks were like a leopard. 
They were quick to conquer. When you look at, and we'll be seeing some of this later on, when you look at Greece and under Alexander, Greece conquered from Macedonia to Africa, even into India. And so they were very quick in their military, and they conquered in a very, very quick fashion. Now, it says in notice verse 6 that the beast had four heads and dominion was given to it. The four heads represent the division of the kingdom after Alexander died. Alexander died in 323 B.C. So his kingdom was divided into four sections. Egypt, Israel, and Arabia came under Ptolemy. Thrace and Bithynia came, after, came under Lysimachus. Macedonia and Greece came in under a man named Cassander. Syria, Babylonia, and territories as far east as India came under Seleucus. So it's just speaking of the division of the empire under Alexander. And then verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Notice this. This is a picture of the Roman Empire. Daniel describes the Roman Empire as dreadful, terrible, and exceedingly strong. In history, it's noted that Rome enslaved and killed its enemies with great violence. They actually would crush them underfoot. And so what we're seeing here is a picture of empires that will exist. These are yet in the future, and this is going to include, and you'll see this in a moment, but this is going to include the last day's pictures because this is a fulfillment of not only what happens during the time of its original appearance, but this is also a picture of what's going to take place in the future. It speaks of ten horns. The ten horns are ten kingdoms that will exist simultaneously in a revived empire. See, the Roman Empire, there are those who would argue the Roman Empire, which is the fourth empire that is spoken of here, never really ceased to exist, but that continues in various forms even to this day. The United States has a form of, of uh, government that takes a lot of its cues from how Rome was. And so it, there, are, there are commentators who believe that, that, that the Roman Empire never really ceased to completely exist but has influenced civilization since then. But in the last days, there's going to be a revival of this Roman Empire, and that's what these ten horns are pictures of. And once again, I'm not going to go into that yet because there is another chapter that we'll be looking at that will take that in some detail and try and develop that with you. But he's talking about ten actual kingdoms that will exist simultaneously in what is called a revived empire. Now, as this is all taking place, and again, this is a panorama. This is portraying the future, picture of the future. He goes on to say in verse 8, he says, I was considering the horns. There was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. We're introduced here to what has been called the little horn. I have mentioned to you before, those of you who are part of our church and all who have gone through studies with me, uh, that one of the titles of Antichrist is the little horn. That's one of the titles. And so there are various titles that he's referred to as. The little horn is one of them. So we're introduced here in verse 8 to what is called the Antichrist. And notice he has uh, eyes of a man, but a mouth that speaks, speaks pompous words. The Antichrist is going to be one who is actually making war against the Lord, the Lord God, and he is going to present himself as greater than God himself. And he's going to be an arrogant military ruler. When we get to chapter 11 in the book of Daniel, in verses 37 and 38, Daniel says he will show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the one desired by women, 
nor will he regard any God, but will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a God of fortresses. So the Antichrist is going to exalt himself. And again, without getting ahead of myself, we know that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the Antichrist is going to present himself as God and is going to be demanding worship. And so in Daniel, he's just introducing us to the idea of this one that is known in, in, in uh, Christian history as the Antichrist. He's introducing us to this one who is going to be a coming world ruler in a revived empire that is it's actually a revived Roman empire. In Revelation, in chapter 13, it says they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So we're introduced to the little horn, who's also referred to as the beast, as well as Antichrist, and this is one who has a mouth that speaks pompous words. Now in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were opened. If there's anything I think that the church has failed to do in, in, in recent history, it's just failed to realize the incredible majesty of God, the God that we worship. I really believe that. I really believe that what we have done very casually and very slowly but very surely is we have taken the majestic God that is revealed to us in Scripture. This picture here is an unbelievable picture of God. I mean, we'll look at that in a little more detail in a moment. But look how he's described. His garment is white as snow. The hair of his head is like pure wool. His throne is a fiery flame. Its wheels a burning fire. When you look at God in this way, I, I believe that the way people casually deal with the Lord and look at God today is a great affront to his, his holiness and his majesty. Yes, he is. Yes, he is our Father, and yes, he is filled with grace and, grace, and yes, he is loving, yes, he's merciful, yes, he's compassionate, yes, he took upon himself human flesh, dwelt amongst us, yes, when you see Jesus, you see God, yes, Jesus wept over those who were lost and, and cared for those who were sick and cast out demons of those who were possessed. He showed great tenderness and mercy. He allowed children to approach him. He would pray for them. He would hold them in his arms. And, and anybody here who's ever had, uh, ever had a, uh, uh, your own child or perhaps a, a spent time with babies know that babies who are toddlers, a year old, two years old, or whatever, less than a year, they, they can drool all over you when, when you hold them. And when, when they're a couple years old and you or going on a couple of years old, you can hold in at a certain point, they'll grab, like, like my kids, I'll give you an example. My kids, when I would, when they were small and just learning to walk, I, I used to have a full beard and I would bend down, and, oh, and they would grab my beard and they would lift themselves up by my beard, <laughs> you know. So kids can do that. Kids can, kids can be, you know, a little difficult. And yet, yeah, I see Jesus, I see him ministering to children they bring the babies to him so that he might bless them, and he, he takes them in his arms, he holds them. Yes, all of that. But we fail to realize sometimes, and maybe we ought to think for at least a moment, maybe this really should be the foundation of everything else we know of him. But it is really, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, Paul said. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. When Moses went up to receive the law and they, they heard the, the thunder, they saw the lightning, the people who remained below while he went on to Sinai with Joshua. And, and, and Moses came down from that, from that encounter with God. And the people said to him, you go and speak to him. We don't want to. There was a holy terror in the hearts of the people because of the God that Moses 
was communing with. The church, I think, has got to come back, if you don't mind, the church has got to come back to an awareness of the incredible holiness of God. And the church needs to come back to an awareness of what an awesome God we worship. And when you read your scriptures and you see these portraits of him, there are thrones. The Ancient of Days is one of his titles. He is seated. And then it describes his garment. It describes him. It describes the throne, the wheels of burning fire, the fiery stream that is issuing. And, and then notice in verse 10, a thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. That, that, that's incredible. That's an incredible portrait of God that I think sometimes we forget. You know, we do have the ability to approach the throne of mercy, obtain grace in our time of need, and thank God for that. Thank God that Jesus Christ took upon himself my sin and, and gave to me that which I didn't have, his righteousness. Thank God for that. Thank God that I can call him Father. You know, in the Old Testament, when the Lord is spoken of in the Old Testament, he is not referred to as Father. He says, well, there's a scripture in Isaiah, thou, O God, art our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter. We are all the works of thy hand, Isaiah says. You are our Father. But the way he's spoken of in that verse is that you are the creator God. That's what the word Father there is, is referencing. You are the creator of all things. You are, you are our Father. But when Jesus was on earth, and there are so many titles that you see in, in Scripture, the God who heals, the God who is there, you know, and, and so many uh, Scriptures that, that give to us insights into who he is. Jesus gave us uh, uh, the, the name that, that, that the Old Testament people did not possess because when he taught us how to pray, this is something that, let this, let this settle, it, please. When he said, this is how you are to pray, what did he say? He said, our Father who art in heaven, our Father. See, the Jews knew him as creator, and they knew him as healer, and they knew him as supplier, and they knew him in so many different ways, and the titles that he has, and the various ways he's spoken of, the mighty God and all. These are, these are all things that help them to understand the God that they worshiped. But we in the New Testament are given that great revelation that he is our Father, and and. I think that sometimes we have taken that father kind of attitude to think that we can take advantage of him in the way that we have taken advantage of our own earthly fathers, and he can't do that. My mom tried to teach us how to respect my dad. If there was anything that my mom worked hard at when I was a little boy, it was to teach us to respect our father. One of the ways that mama taught me how to respect my dad was she respected him. My mom respected my dad. But my dad deserved respect. And I couldn't, uh, believe it or not, I know these are different days now, but there was one word that I wouldn't use with my dad, and that's when he spoke to me. I never said, yeah. I never said, yeah. And I never would have said, man, or anything like that. But I have seen younger people, you know, talk of their father and call him their old man and this and that. That was an attitude of disrespect that I never was trained to have. I was trained that my father, and my mom would say this, my mom would say, your father provides, your father works hard. Your father goes to work early in the morning, he comes home late in the evening. And David, you have shoes on your feet, pants on, you have a shirt, you have, you have food on a table. And it all comes because your father works for you. So you show him respect. So I was raised that way. You show your father respect. But sometimes, guys, I'll be honest with you. In the church, the way people act around the Lord, and, and yes, he's present with us, by the way. The way they, they speak or act, they don't realize how holy he is. So the only way that I have the ability to go into the throne room of grace and obtain mercy in my time of need is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, and because he died on that cross for me, he has made heaven accessible to me. And in prayer and in fellowship, I'm speaking to the Ancient of Days. And this is the picture you have here. He's referred to in that way. He is the Ancient of Days, the Eternal One. And so he says here in verses 9 and 10, he said, I watched till thrones were put in place 
and the Ancient of Days was seated. Obviously, this being a future event. So he has a vision of heaven. And what he's actually seeing is judgment. You're going to be seeing the, the final judgment of the nations, the last ruler of the times of the Gentiles, destroyed with his empire. We see a fifth kingdom revealed that brings in the rule of God. All of this is part of this. Notice in verse 10 how he says, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. So judgment is being pictured here. And, and notice the books, the books were opened here in, in verse 10. The books were opened. And that corresponds with Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. John said, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. Books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Each person was judged according to what he had done. Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. How does your name enter into the book of life? It's when you're saved. Your name is in God's book of life. And so... You know, as he's going through the book, and it's just a picture of that. But as he goes through the books, you know, one of these days, and I like to picture it this way. It's probably not this way. I'm not teaching heresy. I'm just trying. Yes, I am. No, I'm, I'm just trying <laughs> to illustrate it. You know, I, 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 I um, sometimes in my mind's eye, especially when I was a young Christian, I, I would picture books, literal books, and his majestic hand going through that, and then looking at different names, and then finally coming to mind. My name's in that book. It's been written there because I committed my heart to Jesus Christ. And so as this is taking place in verse 11, he says, I watched. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, the Antichrist was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, its body destroyed, given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So this scene is actually shifting back to earth, and he's watching as this Antichrist is speaking. This is a revelation of the final fall of the Antichrist. That occurs at Jesus' second coming. In Revelation 19, verses 19 and 20, I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. He goes on into verse 13. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Okay, this is a picture of the second coming. Again, this is a panorama. This is just giving you a, a view of future events. So he says in verse 13, Behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. In Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. The heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Revelation 1.7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ returns. And it's a picture of coming with the clouds of heaven. I... When I got saved, that was, that was a theme. And I have to be careful. I keep looking at the time. We're going to have communion tonight. 
But I do remember I used to look at the clouds, and every once in a while, the clouds would seem to separate, and there'd be like a giant donut in the sky. I don't know a better way to put it. And I used to think, you know, one of these days, the Lord Jesus is going to come. And I used to kind of picture him coming through like that was a bullseye, and he was coming through. And, and I had this, this incredible sense that the Lord was going to come at any time. You know, it's been 50 years, you know. And, but I am more convinced today that he's coming soon than I've ever been. I, I have to be careful because I can start rolling on this one, and I won't. <laughs> All I know is this. I see things lining up right now. His coming is very soon. There's just, there's just no doubt about that. Anyway, I, I have to go through this chapter. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body. The visions of my head troubled me. I, I came near to one of those who stood by, asked him, this would be an angel, asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. So he's asking, oh, what does this mean? And he receives a general explanation. In verse 17, those great beasts which are four are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So when he speaks of this, the saints of the Most High, that would include Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. It would even include the tribulation saints. But I want you to notice how it says in verse 18, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom. As I was reading this, one of the commentators made a point that I want to, I want to repeat to you because it really it, it reminded me. When you look at issues of faith and the word faith, you, you can have what has been called a faith a passive faith, a faith that rests. But there is also a faith that we have that is called an active faith. And we, we rest in the promises of God, but we also are active in our faith. You see, that, that's how the world gets saved. It's, it's people like us, it's people like you who, who hear the word of God, learn things of Jesus Christ, and then put your faith into action. You're the ones who, who go out into your neighborhoods. You're the one who, who brings it home to your family. You're the one who goes to the job site or to the school or wherever it may be. And, and, and you have conversation with people and, and they ask you, well, what did you do last night? And you say, I went to a Bible study. And they say, Bible study? You still believe in that stuff? And it gives you an opportunity. Well, not only do I believe it, but I live by it. Well, what do you, and now you have opportunity to converse and to share and to talk about the things of the Lord. And that's how the kingdom of God has always gone forward. I'll be sharing a little bit on, on that the next time I occupy the pulpit on a Sunday. I'll be sharing some of those things because that's an active faith. It's a faith that receives. It's a faith that believes in and acts upon what God has said. There are a lot of people who have what I would consider to be almost a dormant faith. They don't do anything. They, they just are passive all the time. But you know what? When you know that, that Christ is returning, when you know that your, your friends and family and, and, and all your neighbors that you know, that they're, that they're perishing without Christ, it just does something within you. It, it causes you to understand the moment and the times that you're living in and to take the opportunity to share with them. And, and I think one of the big problems that Christians have today when it comes to having an active faith is that because the cancel culture is so great today, people are afraid of being canceled. But you know what? Uh, there are so many people who are hungry to know the truth. There are a lot of, you know, we look, oh, this young generation is going to hell in a handbasket. You know what? I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of young people who are just looking for somebody sincere to tell them the truth. Just tell me the truth. What do you really believe? And yes, they can mock you. And yes, they can make you feel bad. And yes, they can make you feel stupid. Um, you know, yeah, that happens. You know, does it happen to me? It can. It can. I can feel stupid. Why, why can't I? I don't have every, every answer for every question. And there are times when I, well, I wish I could answer that when I can't. But that doesn't mean what I, that doesn't mean that what I already know isn't true. It simply means that I have more growth that I need to go through. So I've been, I've been one of those who encourages people in this way for a long time. I haven't done it enough in this church recently, but I'll be honest with you. You know, if we don't tell people about Jesus, who is? 
Who, who's going to do that? You know, are we going to call some evangelist up and say, can you go to my friend's house? We're not. What we're going to do is, is what we ought to do is take the chance to tell them, look, this is what I believe. And, and again, I have to be careful not to go too long on this, but they received the kingdom and they possessed the kingdom forever. That came as a result of an active pursuit. In Luke 16, verse 16, the law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Philippians 3.14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Luke 13.24, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Put your faith into action. And that's what they did. They received the kingdom and possessed it. In verse 19, I, I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron, its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces, trampled the residue with its feet, the ten horns that were on its head, the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes, the mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints, prevailing against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So he's seen this, uh, it would be a picture of the tribulation and the variety of things that are taking place and all of, the, all of the persecution and everything. And there's a war that's taking place. There's going to be a lot of uh, persecution in the seven-year tribulation. And I'm wanting to know about that, he's saying. But he goes on. And he makes it very clear in verse 22. He says, until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints. When he says judgment was made in favor of the saints, that would speak of judgment being made in favor of these believers. And he's wondering about the time that is coming. The time that is coming when the saints are going to possess the kingdom. And so verse 23, he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, shall devour the whole earth, trample it, break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones. He's speaking of Antichrist and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. And shall intend to change times and law. He's going to try and take God's place. He's replacing God. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. This speaks of the three and a half years in the seven-year tribulation, the last three and a half years that are called great tribulation. There'll be an intense persecution, he's saying. But, verse 26, the court shall be seated. They shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms unto the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. The fourth kingdom is going to have worldwide sway. It's going to have Tremendous power. He speaks of the little horn. It will be one uh, a leader with great power. It'll be blasphemous. He will be blasphemous. He will persecute the saints. And as I mentioned, his, his time is limited. He's going to be fully exercising as much power as he can in the final three and a half years of the tribulation. But ultimately, he'll be destroyed and Jesus' kingdom will be fully realized on earth. And notice the final kingdom is everlasting and the saints no longer are persecuted, but now blessed. In Revelation 21, 3 and 4, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No more fears of any sort. No more 
No more pain. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more mourning. No more loss. No more sickness. Somebody has asked, who is the first person you want to see when you go to heaven? I think we all know who that is. Jesus. But who else would you want to see? Who else do you look forward to seeing? Who else? Every one of us probably has one or two, three or four or more. I'll see my dad. I'll see my mom. I'll see my grandfather. I'm going to meet my grandmother. I never knew them on earth. There's a whole lot of people that one day I'm going to see. I'm going to walk up to Pastor Chuck and say, I missed you. How about you? No more tears. No more sorrow. No more pain. No more fear. Nothing except joy. Can you picture that for a moment? Can you? Finally, one day, we'll rest. Finally, all the labors are done. All the hurts are forgotten. All the disappointments fade away. Not a single tear. God will wipe away our tears. Behold, he says, I make all things new. And that includes the letter that's hanging down there. <laughs> and Daniel says, my thoughts greatly troubled me. After I've seen all of this, all I can do is be deeply troubled because there's so much that's going to come upon the earth before the Messiah arrives. And so he says that. He says, verse 28, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me. My countenance changed. I kept the matter in my heart. I, I think that, one last thought, I think that as we look at the way the world is right now, guys, maybe, maybe our hearts ought to be stirred up a little bit. M maybe... Maybe it's, maybe we ought to, instead of being mad at so many sinners and mad at how, how the world has changed so much, maybe instead of being angry all the time, because I see a lot of angry Christians lately. I really do. I wonder, my goodness, what, what, I, I understand. I understand frustration. God knows I do. I'm a father. I had kids frustrate me to this day. I understand frustration. I understand disappointment. But I also understand hope. I also understand a God with whom nothing is impossible. I also believe that God's gospel can still change hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that if I didn't, I'd retire from ministry and go do something else. But I believe it. I believe that there's still hope for this world. There is. Because Jesus is my hope. He is my hope. And I look to the blessed hope. The appearing of my great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so until that moment, let's press in. Let's serve the Lord. Let's, let's, let's realize that we're in a, bu a building that's on fire. And that we have the ability and responsibility to do everything we can to bring as many people out of that fire as we can. It would be a very selfish thing for me to just run out of the building and leave everybody behind. Don't we call them heroes, those in 9-11 who did that kind of thing, rushed back to a, 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 to a, a building that eventually collapsed and, and, and killed many people who were heroes, heroic, who were rescuers. Well, guess what? Maybe we can do that. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we have people that, that God is putting in, in our path that, that we can influence for Christ. Maybe, maybe that kid that bothers you so much at work is, is, the next, is, is, is the next great evangelist. You don't know that. You don't know that. 
You don't know that person that you lead to Christ. You don't know what they're going to be, but God knows what he can do with them. And all he needs me to do, if you will, all he has commanded me to do is to share his love with people and he'll take care of the rest. And so if I keep my eyes on everything that I see around me that, that bothers me, and it does, it does. The world that I live in now isn't the world I grew up in by any means. But that doesn't mean that there's no hope for it because Jesus is our hope. And if our hearts are troubled a bit by it, well, maybe we ought to do something to change it. And what's going to change the world, guys? The gospel. The gospel. So be faithful. Share the Lord with people. Pray for them. And who knows? That person that irritates you so much, they may come to faith in Christ. And now you can, you can see God do something wonderful. I can't tell you how many people looked at me and said, that's a lost cause. I can't tell you, including my mom and dad. But guess what? God had other plans. And he has other plans for, for people too. Don't forget that. Anyway, may that stir your heart to do something for Jesus. Father, we ask that even as we've just done an overview, the beginning portion that's prophetic, I, I just ask that we, the church, would take... Uh, Seriously, the responsibilities that you've given to us to take your gospel and to preach it. And so, Lord, I ask that we would do that and, and that, Lord, we would, we would realize that there's always hope with you and you do make all things new. And so I pray that you would work in us to that end. And perhaps as our eyes are closed, there may be some in this room right now, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and you need to get right with the Lord. Well, before we enter into our closing with communion, if you know you need to get right with the Lord, if you're watching online, you can do this obviously at home, but if you're in this room and you need to get right with the Lord, I'd like to pray for you. And if you need to, would you raise your hand and let me pray for you right where you're at right now. Just raise your hand. Father, you see these hands. You know the reason why they're being raised to you. In Jesus' name, I ask that you would reach down and that you would touch each person whose hand is raised. May they know that their names are in your book. May they look forward to being with you one day. And if there's something they're going through right now, I pray in Jesus' name that you would relieve them and that you would work in them. And so our hearts are open to you now, Jesus. Wash and cleanse us. Fill us with your presence. And we receive that which you are offering. And we bless you for it. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And Jesus, as we prepare now, to receive of communion, I ask that you would speak to us and meet us in a special way. In your name we pray, amen.